recording. Okay, so we'll do four or five. Next week we finish chapter four. And then we only have one more chapter left. And you know, Thanksgiving kind of comes right in the middle there. And I've made that a holiday catch up week. So no new material on Thanksgiving week because so many students end up missing, you know, that one day. <laughs> um, so it's a good time to catch up if you're behind or if you feel like, you know, looking ahead, you can um, because I feel like the end of the semester wraps up really quickly after we get back from Thanksgiving. And then it's a whole lot to study and everything. So you could even start working on your final exam review. Dad, Dad is really upset. Mommy's teaching. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> okay. Can you open the door? Okay. All right. So there's that. Babs. Is there something else? Oh, yeah. Um, I also just wanted to mention that you may have received an email about course evaluations. This is the first semester that our school is doing this in all of the classes. So you probably, no, 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 hon. So you probably have these available in all of your classes. And I believe you just got an email where you could click a link and it'll take you there and it'll show up also on your Canvas dashboard, I believe. Um, I'll have to look again to see if there's another place like directly in our Canvas or maybe someone knows. But anyways, I just want you to know that those are completely voluntary. I'm the only one who sees that information and it'll be anonymous. So you guys can, you know, feel free to share what you want. I'm also a big believer in Rate My Professors. I would have absolutely loved that as a student. Um, we did the same thing just kind of word of, by word of mouth. You know, we used to ask everybody, who did you take for this? And what did you think, et cetera? Um, and I feel like that's the only way I got through college. <laughs> so I think it's really helpful because people have different kind of learning styles and everything, you know. So it's good to to kind of ask your friends or look on now, rate my professors. It's really good. So, okay. Also, you pretty good reviews on Rate My Professor. Yeah, yeah. So that's good for me to know too, you know. Um, and sometimes, you know, I'll read one that's not very good or whatever. And, um, you know, I take it to heart. Like if there's something that I can do better, uh, you know, I've been teaching now over 25 years and I keep changing things based on student feedback, mostly, to be honest. So, um, you know, I try to do surveys and um, I'm like, do I have one in this class? Maybe not this semester, but um, yeah, I oftentimes will have a survey myself in a class. So, okay, I knew there was one other thing I wanted to point out. In week 10, um, notice in addition to lecture notes, I have this curve sketching, rational asymptotes, and derivative test summary, okay? So these three documents, it's interesting that that one shows up with a good accessibility score when it's just a handwritten bunch of math stuff. I don't know why. But yeah, so I recommend you guys, you know, download all three of those. And I have them pulled up here on my iPad. Let me see.
Okay, so this is that derivative test summary that we looked at just last time. All right, so really handy, all kind of in one place, so you can compare the first and second derivative tests. Um, they can both help you define local max and mins. And the second derivative test also tells you concavity. Um, and then we also know this increasing, decreasing test with first derivatives. Right. So there's that. And then I have this page on rational asymptotes. And again, how this has a high accessibility score, I just don't know. And why doesn't this one? Maybe because of the pictures. Do I not have it? If I do not. Hmm. Because I've been kind of working on that. But anyways, um, this is a handy um Good morning. We're in chapter four in 4.5. And um, I just downloaded three documents from module 10. In our week 10, these three documents here, the 4.5. And so this rational asymptotes, mm -hmm. if you have a rational function, P over Q. So in other words, you have a polynomial function on the top, polynomial function on the bottom. And these are standard ways to write polynomial functions. You know, you have some leading coefficient and the highest um, exponent and then the next highest, et cetera, et cetera. So N is the degree of the top, K is the degree of the bottom. If you have a rational function for vertical asymptotes, You get a vertical asymptote x equals a if a is a zero of the denominator, so a zero of the bottom, but not a zero of the numerator. So quick example, right? Notice two gives you a zero of the bottom. It is a zero of the bottom, but it is not a zero of the top. So we have a vertical asymptote at that vertical line, x equals two. In red, I have the calculus way. <laughs> x equals a is a vertical asymptote if and only if the limit as x goes to a from the left of the function gives you positive or negative infinity, or the limit as x goes to a from the right of the function gives you positive or negative infinity, okay? So if you come from the left or the right and the function goes to positive or negative infinity, that's what it means to have a vertical asymptote, right? For horizontal asymptotes, okay? So if N is less than K, N is the degree on the top, K is the degree on the bottom. So I have a little example here. N two is less than K, which is three. Then we get a horizontal asymptote at Y equals zero. And that's because the bottom is growing way faster than the top, okay? The degree of the bottom is higher than the degree on the top. So we get that kind of a horizontal asymptote. Now, if the degree on the top is the same as the degree on the bottom, n equals k, 
then you get a horizontal asymptote at y equals the ratio of those leading coefficients. Okay, so here I just made a little example. The degree of both is three. The horizontal asymptote is the line y equals four fifths. Okay. The a sub n b sub k, that's the leading coefficient at the top, leading coefficient at the bottom. Okay. Now the calculus version. So, you know, this stuff in black, we've learned this in algebra and pre-calculus. Right? In red, this is what we just learned in calculus. So y equals c is a horizontal asymptote. So like here, c is 0. Here, c is 4 fifths. If and only if, because it's a definition, the limit as x goes to infinity of the function equals c if the limit as x goes to negative infinity of the function equals c. Okay. So again, you imagine, you know, going to infinity, here the bottom trumps the top. I mean, the for sure the constants don't matter. You can imagine factoring out an x squared on the bottom and it cancels with the x squared on the top you still have one x on the bottom. And if you took the limit as x went to positive or negative infinity, you would get zero. And then same idea here, the constants on the end, even if you had like an x squared or whatever, you know, the leading terms are really going to dominate the behavior. So you could disregard everything else. And if you disregarded everything else, the x cubes would cancel. And so you get four fifths. So that's the idea. So we have if n is less than k, if n is equal to k, and now what if k is just one bigger, or you know, the bottom is just one bigger, or uh, the top is one bigger, sorry n is less, n is equal, or n is bigger by one. Okay, so here's an example where the degree of the top is one bigger than the degree of the bottom. In this case, you're gonna get what's called an oblique or a slant asymptote. Okay, and the line is y equals the quotient. So you can do the division and you get the quotient and you can disregard the remainder. And I don't know why it kind of split like this. Um, but if you did the division for this little example, divide x minus 2 into x squared plus 1, you could also use synthetic division, right? You get x plus 2, that's your quotient, and you have a rem remainder of 5. So the remainder goes over the divisor, and that's your remainder function. Again, this is your quotient function. So the oblique asymptote is y equals that quotient. Okay. <sighs> so these are just kind of handy dandy, you know, again, one page summaries. I used to create these when I was in college to help me piece together things that probably, you know, showed up across many different chapters. So it's handy to just have it all in one place. Like, hey, what's the deal with asymptotes? What's the deal with local max and mins or concavity? 
right? Stuff like that. No, no, no. <laughs> All right, the last one of those three sheets I suggest that you download is this page on curve sketching. Okay. Sunshine. Funny. You're okay, huh? It's okay. So these are some handy sheets that I found online that I've been using for years, actually. It's kind of like that calculus cheat sheet. It's just a brilliant summary of curve sketching. And that's what 4.5 is on, a summary of curve sketching. And so it's got a blank place here for you to work on sketching this graph by hand. I'm trying. The idea is to follow these steps, you know, identify what's the domain, what are the intercepts, is there any symmetry, even odd periodic functions, find any asymptotes, horizontal or vertical asymptotes. And look, it even says vertical asymptote where A is the zero of the denominator, but not of the numerator. You take the limit as x goes to a. You could also compute long division to find oblique asymptotes. Um, to find local extrema, max and mins, you could do the first derivative test, right? Find critical points, create a sign chart. You could do the second derivative test, right? Find the second derivative. Find the points where the second derivative is zero or doesn't exist, create the sign ch chart, find any points of inflection, find intervals of concavity. Um, and then, you know, go ahead and do your, your curve sketching. So here is a polynomial function. I apologize, these don't turn out, didn't turn out very good. You've got a rational function, another polynomial function, etc. A power function. I also have all the solutions. Okay. So what you might want to do is, you know, just look at the first one, give it a try. And then again, you've got the solutions here. And again, the second page... You know, it was a little hard to read, but there are the two functions. So you could make sure you have those written right. And then it's all worked out for you. All right, and here, they're all worked out for you. So this is kind of putting together, you know, a lot of the stuff that we saw on in this chapter with max and mins and whatnot. So this is where we left off. So I'll go ahead and do one. The cat will let me. Sunshine. Oh, 
going downstairs now. Okay, so let's sketch this. So first, I'm going to go ahead and factor the top and the bottom. And okay, Lisha, I'm sorry, I just saw your question. Yes, it's in the the sheet. You can download it. It's in module 10. Here's the curve sketching examples and solutions. Module 10. All three of them. The rational asymptotes and the derivative tests. Yep. You're welcome. Okay, so that keeps going away over there. You can cancel those. Isn't that weird? Um, Keeps going away when I write. I don't know how to freeze that. I guess there's a thing. God, it's always going to be something. Okay. So this means that there's a hole at one. And, and you can find the matching Y. So there's a hole at one, one sixth. And then following those um, curve sketching sheets, which are really handy, let's look at the domain. So the domain, it's the set of all x, except x cannot be 1 or 7. Okay. And then for the intercepts, so you could let x be 0. And so the y-intercept is zero. And let y equal zero. And you get x equals zero. All right. So these are all things that I'm kind of boxing in red that are going to help us to graph. And three, does the function have any symmetry? So I just want to remind you. Right, for symmetry, for even functions, when you plug in negative x into f, you get the same function back. And for odd functions, when you plug negative x in, you get the opposite of the function. Okay, so to check for symmetry, you're going to plug in negative x. So you plug negative x in. Oh, 
Okay, so that does not equal, you know, the original function. And it doesn't equal the opposite. So there's no symmetry. Now for the asymptotes. For horizontal asymptotes. I mean, we could just look. <laughs> and y is negative one. I'm going to put by looking in equals k. Right, they have the same power. So it's the ratio of the coefficients, positive one and negative one. So you get negative one. Same here, negative one and positive one. Okay. And I'll just say, or if you took the limit and say x went to either positive or negative infinity. Um, of x over 7 minus x. And you want to divide the top and bottom by the highest power denominator. That'd be x. So you get 1 over 7 over x minus 1. So that goes to 0. And you just get negative 1. So again, I'm boxing in things that are going to help us to graph. If I were standing in front of a classroom with a bunch of different whiteboards, I'd be, you know, graphing kind of as we go. Let's do it down here. I never managed to kind of do things right to scale, but so we had a hole at one, one six. It was a hole right there. And then we had X and Y intercepts at zero. One, one, six, and then we have the intercepts. There's no symmetry, and now I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals negative. Okay. Let's do vertical asymptotes. So we already know seven is a zero of the denominator, but not the numerator.
Okay, so we've got x equals seven. as the vertical asymptote. You could also do it the calculus way. Write the limit as x goes to seven from the left. So as we go to seven from the left, this is gonna be positive because X is gonna be less than seven. Okay, so think about that for a minute. You're coming to seven from the left, right? So you have a number like maybe 6.9 or something. If you subtract off 6.9, you're gonna have a positive 0.1. So the bottom is gonna be positive. And it's gonna be really, really, really small. You divide by a number that's really, really, really small, you get a number that's really, really, really big. So this goes to positive infinity. If you go to seven from the right, so that means like over here, Right now you're subtracting off more than seven. So you get a negative number, something less than zero on the bottom. Because X is greater than seven. So you have a negative tiny, tiny number. When you divide by a tiny, tiny number, this gets really big that you're dividing by a negative. Okay. So that's that vertical asymptote. It's four. All right, first derivative test. Let's take the first derivative. So we've got the bottom to minus times the derivative of the top. You can even look right here, right? The bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. So you've got seven minus X plus X that gives you just seven. Over seven minus X quantity squared. Okay, so think about no matter what value I put in for x, once I square that, right, I subtract it and then I square, by squaring, it's going to be positive, right? The bottom is going to be positive. The top is already positive. So this is positive for all values in the domain. So this function is increasing over its domain. There's no extrema. All right. 
second derivative. So that first derivative, let's write it as seven times seven minus X to the negative two. Now bring the negative two down, subtract one, multiply by the derivative of what's inside. Okay, so this can never be zero. In order to be zero, you would have to have a zero on the top or be able to get a zero on the top. Okay, so we have no inflection points. Oh, I, I guess that's coming up. All right, so critical values are where the function equals zero or it doesn't exist. So it doesn't exist at seven. Okay. So when x is less than seven, that second derivative, again, it's greater than zero. All right, so again, think about that. You're subtracting off a number smaller than seven, so you get a positive number. 14 over a positive number is positive. Okay, so this function is concave up. I would say all the way from negative infinity to seven, but remember, the function cannot equal one. I mean, we have the hole there. Okay. So you kind of think, oh, from negative infinity up to seven, but you have to remove the one. So from negative infinity to one, and from one to seven. And then when X is greater than seven, the second derivative, so now you're subtracting more than seven on the bottom. That's going to give you a negative. When you cube it, it's negative. 14 over a negative is negative. So the function is concave down on 7 to infinity. Okay, so there are no inflection points because um, it doesn't exist at seven. Okay, so even though this changes concavity, it doesn't exist there. Okay. 
It has to be continuous. And then, hey, you could plot a few points. And we see the function looks like this. All right. So let me bring you around. This is four or five. These problems are super long, as you just witnessed. So I only chose six problems, okay? And notice the way WebAssign does it. Use the guidelines to sketch the curve, and then you just select, you know, the correct curve. In the solutions, they give all the steps, right? The domain, the intercept, symmetry, asymptotes, et cetera. So notice none of these ask you, I don't believe, to enter intervals of concavity or, I mean, anything. You're just selecting the graph. Okay. Um, I'm gonna stop recording.